Hey, it's Sarah, and today I'm back to tell you about language difference versus language disorder. And if you want a little more information, I touched on this topic in my last video about bilingual speech therapy evaluation. But today I'm going to dive deeper into what that really means in the realms of articulation of speech sounds and language grammar skills. And so when I say language, I'm going to be try to be as specific as possible. Whenever I say language, I'm referring to grammar, syntax, those kinds of parts of our language versus a language that somebody speaks. We need to be very clear about who's getting labeled as disordered and who's not. And we have to be very careful that we don't label the wrong people disordered. And I want to be sure to share with you that I have a handout all about the differences between Spanish and English. And so I want you to definitely go ahead and click um, below to make sure you get access to this handout. Um, it's all about the exact differences that you would see in Spanish uh, compared to English. And so, for example, if a kid says shovel with a B for a V, in Spanish, B and V do not have a phoneme distinction. So you can often hear Spanish speakers say vaca, vaca, instead of vaca, the way it's spelled. It looks like it's a V. That's because in English we have a very, very different um, sound system, especially as it focuses on V and B. Totally. In Spanish, B and V go together. It's more of like a bilabial fricative. Vaca, vaca. It's, it's not as hard as that English V, because the English V is a uh, voiced F. So we would say um, very, you know, it's a very, um, you know, it's a hard hitting V. And our most Spanish speakers do not have an SH. There are a couple very small pockets in, in Mexico where there's a dialect that does use an SH sound. But on the whole, most Spanish speakers do a CH for an SH. It doesn't exist in Spanish. So that's so important that we're making it very clear that that's somebody that doesn't have a speech impairment. And so when we get kids that come from other places, assessment is critical. Now I wanna tell you about an experience that I had with a student that came to me from Central America. Now, this student was brand new to English. The student only spoke Spanish. And um, the teacher said to me, I can't understand her. And so I screened the student and started working with the student as a speech RTI. And I definitely noticed um, one thing that stood out in particular was a very, very he heavy lisp. And so I started with the student uh, and um, she seemed to pick up what she needed to do to make the, the S sound that we know. So let's fast forward. Um, after the student was getting speech RTI for a little while, I ended up deciding that I was going to do an evaluation. And I did notice some improvement. One day, a paraprofessional at the school I was at took me to the side and said, you know, I want to tell you that my husband comes from the exact same place that this student comes from in this country in Central America. They speak like that. That is part of their dialect is the lisping. And so that was a huge light bulb moment for me. I did complete the evaluation on the student and by that point her lisp was gone and part of I think why she remedied this so quickly is it was an accent it was a dialect it was not a disorder and she didn't qualify for speech therapy and thank goodness I didn't make a mistake and label her as disordered. Now, when you do feel like there's a definite speech problem, it's, for example, those shared phonemes. A kid can't say the CH sound, that's 
that's going to be something you're going to want to tackle depending on age. Because um, both of those sounds are required in Spanish and English. A kid can't say the L sound. Yep, we're going to need that. We're going to need that in both English and Spanish, and that would be when you'd want to tackle those goals. So let's think about language, okay? And I'm going back to that grammar, syntax, those kind of things impact how people speak when they're bilingual. We need to see the deficits in both languages. So you don't have something in this language, you don't have it in that language, that's when we're going to be concerned. I had a student say something like, um, that house tiny. Well, in Spanish, you do put the adjective at the end. That student is getting influenced by Spanish speaking. That is not a disorder, that's a difference. That's a student piecing together syntax rules and learning them. I've been learning Chinese, and I'm telling you, very basic Chinese. Like, I'm very learning very basic Chinese, but I am absolutely loving learning about the grammar and syntax of Chinese because it totally gives me insight into why Chinese speakers speak English the way they do. Now Chinese, there's no conjugation of verbs. And so then when you hear somebody who speaks Chinese and they make a mistake with a verb, that's a difference. That's not a disorder in English. What we want to know is somebody who's truly disordered. If they were making a lot of mistakes in their native language and they're making a lot of mistakes in English, that's how we know. This is where really good parent interviews come into play. So I'm going to leave a link below to a resource I found online for parent interview information, questions to answer, and then I also want you to download my list of the speech sounds and differences between English and Spanish so you can like put that up on the bulletin board right right by your desk and you know when you're doing evaluation you can do a quick check if you forget um, which sounds you hear in Spanish you don't hear in English or vice versa.